Hey guys, Miss Peterson here, and welcome to our lecture on circular motion. So go ahead and get up to take notes in your preferred style. I recommend Cornell style, that's how my notes are structured. But go ahead and set it up in whatever way works for you. So what even is circular motion? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's when an object travels in a circle. For the purposes of this class, we will focus only on objects that are traveling at a constant speed around a circle with a constant radius. We will get into a little bit about how elliptical or like oval um, orbits work, but that's later in this unit. Now, we know that velocity is distance over time. If we're talking about a circle, that distance is 2 pi r, the circumference of the circle. And if you remember from geometry, okay, 2 pi r, that is the radius. So the time to complete one circle also has a special name. It is called the period of the orbit. And that is just the time that it takes to complete one complete circle. So by dividing the circumference of the circle by the time to complete one circle, we get the orbital velocity. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and talk about acceleration. Now, this can get a little bit confusing because normally when we think about acceleration, we only think about speeding up or slowing down. But in the case of centripetal motion and centripetal uh, acceleration, the speed of the object is constant. Rather, what is changing is the direction. So remember, velocity includes both magnitude and direction because it's a vector. And because, as you can see here, okay, that direction of the velocity is constantly changing, it is accelerating. And we can calculate that acceleration using this force, this equation right here, where we have the A sub C means centripetal acceleration okay so the acceleration at any single moment in time this is usually in units of meters per second squared for this class um, if you take more advanced physics later on you will actually you can actually measure it in degrees as well like how many degrees it's moved in the circle okay velocity is just that the orbital velocity and that gets squared, and r is the radius, typically in meters, and velocity is meters per second squared. Now, the derivation of this formula is a little bit confusing because you're probably thinking, wait, but acceleration is always change in velocity over time. Why is this velocity squared over the radius? And the proof for it is a little complicated. Uh, much of the proofs rely on calculus, but there are some great geometry proofs of that. They're just a little too much for this lecture, but I will give you guys those and you can look them up on YouTube, derivations of the centripetal acceleration, to show you how this equation is actually the same as change in velocity over time for an object in circular motion. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So now let's get on to centripetal force. Now, centripetal force is an inward force, okay? It is always an inward force that causes objects to move in a circle. If I take my keys right now and I spin them around like this, okay, the force that's keeping them moving in a circle is the tension in our lanyard. When you're on a car and you like go through a turn, Okay, it is the friction of the road that provides that force. If you are a satellite orbiting the Earth, it is the force of gravity that keeps you in orbit, but it's always directed inward. Okay, so for centripetal force, it is going to be equal to times the mass times the centripetal acceleration. Plugging in that formula I just showed you, we have that the centripetal force equals mv squared over r. Okay, so again, F sub C is the centripetal force. M is the mass, V is the velocity, and R is the radius. Now, because we have the force, which is always going to be in units of newtons, 
Newtons, remember, are mathematically equal to a kilogram meter per second squared. So we will have to be careful that when we use this equation, our mass is in kilograms, our velocity is in meters per second, and our radius is in meters, just to keep those units consistent. Okay. Now I'm gonna tell you about the circular motion F word. Okay. That's centrifugal. Now, centrifugal force is that outward force that you feel when something's moving in a circle, okay? If you've ever been on a ride in an amusement park that goes in a circle and you feel that force pushing you outward toward the outside of the circle or um, one of those uh, little things on the playground that spin around, okay? You feel a force pulling you outward, but that force doesn't actually exist. The only force that exists is the one pulling you inward. So why would you feel that outward force? Why does it seem like there's a force trying to pull you out of that circle? The answer is inertia. So according to inertia, objects resist acceleration. So just like we resist slowing down or speeding up, we resist changing direction. Okay, it's kind of like in a roller coaster or an airplane, when you take off really fast, you feel a force pushing you back. But that's just because your inertia wants to stay back, or yeah, wants to stay back while everything else is moving forward. Or in a car crash, you feel a forward force, and that's because you want to keep moving forward, but the seatbelt exerts a backward force to stop you. Okay, in a circle, you feel a force making you want to go into a straight line, but that's just because of your inertia. Okay, you're feeling the opposite of that force that is keeping you in the circle. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and look at some example problems. Starting with this one. We have an LDA varsity track and field team. It's a regional composition and we're doing the discus. So that's the one where you have the disc and you swing it around and then you throw it. It, it whirls around uh, a 1.6 kilogram discus in a circle with a radius of 1.1 meter, about an arm's length, before ultimately reaching a speed of 52 meters per second just before launch. And we're going to discuss the net force. Okay, so first, let's just think about these forces. Okay, on that discus, we have the force of gravity. And he's applying a force to keep it like held up against gravity. And those ones are gonna cancel out. But it is the force of his arm holding it in a circle, okay, and holding it there that is the centripetal force, okay? That one is the centripetal force. And we're gonna be using our centripetal force equation to find it. So, like always in our physics problems, we need to start by listing our variables. So we have 1.6 kilograms. So mass is 1.6 kilograms. We have the radius of 1.1 meter and the speed of 52 meters per second. Okay, that's all of the information we need and we just need to plug it into this equation. So. The centripetal force, the force that he has to hold it with while it's traveling that speed is 1.6 kilograms times 52 meters per second squared divided by 1.1 meter. And we plug that into our calculator. And we get a net force of 3,933, or 3,933. I'm just going to round it to two digits, since all of our answers had two numbers given had two digits, and say 3,900 newtons. Okay. And just so you guys can see how those units work out, we have kilograms. And then meters per second squared, so meters squared over second squared, divided by meter. That meter cancels out with that one, so we're left with kilogram meter per second squared, which is mass units times acceleration units, okay? Mass times acceleration, F equals MA, 
Those are newtons, our unit for force. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Let's look at a slightly harder problem involving the universe. So, in this one, it tells us the force of gravitational attraction between Earth and the moon. Okay, so in this one, we're going to be looking at the centripetal force which is the force of gravity that keeps the moon in orbit around the earth. And they tell us that that force is 2.0 times 10 to the 20th newtons. Okay. And that is the force of gravity. It is the centripetal force. The moon. Okay. So the mass of the moon is 7.35 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms. The mass of Earth is 6.0 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And then the radius of the orbit is 3.84 times 10 to the 8th meters. And we want to know how fast the moon is moving. Now, this is a bit of an unrealistic problem, okay? Normally, we can find the velocity and see, like, by looking at it through telescopes and stuff, how fast something's moving, and then use that to determine its mass, but we're just going to go with it, okay? So, it's moving in a circle. We know we're going to use our equation for centripetal force, but we have a problem. We only have one mass here, and we have two masses here. Which mass should I use? If you said the mass of the moon, you are correct, okay? So whenever we're using this centripetal force equation, this is the mass of the orbiting body. It's always gonna be the mass of the thing that orbits. This, the mass of the Earth is important. It is the mass of them that determine this force that they feel between them. But if we know that force, we don't need to consider the mass of the Earth, just the effect that it has on the moon, that centripetal force. And we are working with big numbers in scientific notation. So if you need a review on how to plug scientific notation into your calculator, make sure you're either Googling it or asking me. Um, on my calculator, it is this little EE -E button over the X times 10 to the negative 1. So, for example, if I was entering this force, it would be 2.0 EE20, and that is 10.0 times 10 to the 20th. Okay. Now, I want to solve for the velocity, so I know I'm going to need to reorganize this equation. I can reorganize it now or later. Um, I could put in the numbers and then solve it out, but I think it's a little bit easier to reorganize it before. Um, especially when I'm working with big numbers like this. So in order to reorganize it, first I'm trying to get the velocity by itself, so I'm going to multiply both sides by r. So I have the centripetal force times the radius equals mv squared. Okay, trying to get velocity by itself, so divide by mass, divide by mass, and then to undo the squared, I take the square root of it. So I end up with velocity equals the square root of the centripetal force times the radius divided by the mass. And I'm ready to plug in my numbers. So the velocity equals the square root of the centripetal force, 2.0 times 10 to the 20th. I'm going to rewrite newtons uh, using what it's actually made of, kilogram meters per second squared, so that I can show you how the units work out. Okay. multiplied by the radius, 3.84 times 10 to the 8th meters, divided by the mass of that orbiting body, the mass of the moon, times 10 to the 22nd kilograms. Okay, so I'm going to plug that all into my calculator. 2.0 times 10 to the 20th times 3.84 times 10 to the 8th, divided by 7.35, times 10 to the 22. So right now I have the square root of 1.04 times 10 to the 6th. Okay, 
and if we're looking at the units at that point, kilogram and kilogram will cancel out. So I have meters per second squared times meters. So it's meters squared per second squared. Okay. So that when I take the square root of it, I get an orbital velocity of 1022 meters per second. Okay. Which I did double check this. This is the actual orbital velocity of the moon. Okay. It goes really fast. Okay, cool. Okay, cool.